So we're going to start. Uh, the next two problems are kind of inspired by problems that might be similar to homework problems, or who knows? And they're getting back to the idea of, well, how do we set things up? And so it's a little bit about translation. We have this sort of idea, maybe some, some wordage, and we want to say, OK, how do we get out a differential equation? So the first example. We're going to set up a differential equation for the curve y equals f of x, which satisfies that the tangent line to the curve at a point, and really we mean at any point on the curve. So we have this curve out there with this amazing property. What's the property? That the tangent line at a point, x comma y, hits the axis at the point 3x comma 0. And there's a second part, and we'll do the second part later. But let's get the first part, make some progress there. So what's the picture? So we should, we should draw a picture to sort of like get our intuition going here. So the picture, all right, we have a curve of some sort. Now, we don't know what the curve is, and that's OK. That doesn't mean we can't draw a picture. We, we're trying to draw a picture now to build up understanding. So we'll say, maybe it's a curve that does something like this. All right, that's fine. It's just a sketch to get us going. And now we say, OK, here's our curve. This is our, our curve y. And it tells us the following. It says, suppose you're at a point x comma y. And it says, take the tangent line to that curve at that point. So OK, we take that tangent line. Do, 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 do. And it says, we hit the axis at this point. 3x comma 0. All right. So this wonderful curve, if it exists, we don't know, probably does. That's the picture that we go along. And it's going to be true regardless of which point x, y we choose. All right. So now, let's think about what we want. Well, we know what we want because we want to get the, the points. And it tells us, set up a differential equation. So we know we're going to set up a differential equation. So if we're going to set up a differential equation, what's one thing we're going to need? We're going to need a derivative, because the differential equation says there's a derivative involved. And so we say, OK, great. y prime. We're already making progress. Now, we're not done, because that's not a differential equation. The differential equation says y prime equals something. We just got the y prime. So now we start to say, OK, we've got to get some intuition. What is y prime? How does it relate to what we're trying to do? So how does y prime fit into this problem? I think there was a hand. Is it the tangent line? OK, so y prime has something to do with the tangent line. What does it have to do with the tangent line? Slope. Slope. y prime captures the rate of change. It's telling us how the function is doing. So when we talk about y prime, and in particular in relationship to tangent line, we say, oh, y prime. We say this is our slope of our tangent line. Great, great. Now, that's not a formula, but that's helping us understand what to do. And we say, well, I have this line. Can I get the slope? Because if I can, then I can put down what the slope is. Well, how much information do we need to get the slope? Two points. How many points do we have? Two points. Oh, it's like a sign that, that we can make progress here. All right, so we oftentimes say, OK, great. Slope is our rise over run. OK, so how much? is the rise. Y uh, or negative Y? Well, which one? Well, that's kind of a weird answer. It could be either. It just depends on what you consider the first point and the second point. And, and then that, that determines it. So if it's this is the first point and this is the second point, then you went down by Y. But of course, you could say, no, no, no. Swap the roles. 
So if we think of this as the first point, that's the second point, we went down by y, and that would give us negative y. How much did we go over? 2x, right? Because we went from x to 3x. That was 2x's worth of moving over. So what's our slope? Negative y over 2x. And that's a perfectly fine answer. If you don't like fractions, what can you do? Yeah, multiply that across. So we can say, okay, so 2x times y prime should equal negative y. And there's a nice differential equation. And so the curve that has this property has to satisfy that differential equation. And I mark tangent here because there's a second part. Now the second part says, what if it instead of being the tangent line, it were the normal line? All right. Now the question is, what does it mean by the normal line? What is that? Perpendicular. Yeah, perpendicular. So when you hear the word normal, you should think perpendicular. For example, if you've had calc 3, you'll talk about the normal vector, and that's the vector which is perpendicular. So now, instead of being like this purple curve, it's probably more like this green curve. So it's going to be perpendicular. So, in that case, for the normal, well, we don't have to do a lot of work. What's the relationship between the slope of the tangent versus the slope of the normal? They're perpendicular, but how does that translate into these, these values? What do we do? Opposite reciprocal? Okay, what do you mean by opposite in this case? Uh, negative. negative, yeah. So when you want to have two lines have perpendicular slopes, it means negative reciprocal. So you flip it over and change the sign. So we do that. So y prime will become what? 2x over y. Or we could say y times y prime had better equal 2x. And there we go, this is the normal. All right, great. And that's it, that's it. That's not so bad, these are fun. So we can set up differential equations. Well, I think we can. Let's try another example. Set up a differential equation to model the following situation. And really what this problem is, it says, I'm gonna give you a big block of text. And this is how they used to do math. They were like, we're going like, to use lots and lots of words for you to keep track of. And when I say used to, we're talking hundreds of years ago. And then they realized, wait a second, we can reduce all this wordage down to very simple formulas by using expressions and uh, nice, good uh, variable names. And so that's what we're doing. We're going to set up a differential equation that translates that, that statement. So it's like we're, we're, we're translating from English into math. This is good. This is good. All right, so here we go. A rumor is spreading through a community with a, with a fixed population P. So we've introduced a symbol P. P is population. Now, is P variable or constant? Constant. How do we know? Fixed. Okay where the number of people who have heard the rumor so far is W. Is that a variable or a constant? That's a variable, because that can change. OK, good. So W is our variable. All right, so far, that's just telling us what our symbols are. So now we know our symbols. OK, then this next sentence. At any given time, the number of people that learn about the rumor is proportional to the square root of how many people who have not yet heard the rumor. All right. Now, there's a couple reactions. If you saw this, for example, on a, a test, you might say, let me go to the next problem. I'll come back to this one. But we're not going to do that because we're not on a test. What we're going to do is just parse the sentence. And there's about four or five key parts of the sentence. So let's start with the beginning. Uh, the number of people that learn about the rumor. Let's start with that. How can we translate that 
into our symbols. What does that correspond with? Well, be careful. Is it W or W prime? So it's the number of people that learn about the rumor, but what is W? Number of people who have heard the rumor. That's like all the people who know it. Right now, I'm saying, who just learned about it? So what is this capturing? It's like a change. So when we capture change, what do we write? W prime. So W prime. Good. That's the first important part of the sentence. Now the next one, also important, is, what does that translate to? Equals. You know that one. Good. All right. Making progress here. Next part. Proportional to. What does that mean when we say something's proportional to? Right. It means that there's some constant involved. Okay. We just make one up. What do you want to call our constant? Okay. All right. It's proportional to, just means we introduce a constant. So there's some constant. Okay. Well, the next part's not so hard. The square root of, well, that means there's a square root. You're like, wow. Uh, who would have thought? Okay. But, but we keep going. How many people who have not yet heard the rumor? So how do we figure that out? P minus W. Because the, there's a whole population, and there's some people who know the rumor, so the, the P minus W is those who haven't. So this is P minus W. All right. And now, what's next? Black box. Well, if you want to solve it, right? But what are we asked to do? Set it up. Set it up. So, so what is our next step? Just the normal box. That's the answer. That's it. Progress. OK, so it's not so bad. See, if you, if you look at it all at once, it, it gets like, ah! But if you say, say, OK, what does this part of the sentence say? Oh, OK, I, I can translate that's a W prime, is, equals, and so forth and so on. Each individual part's not so bad. So don't feel overwhelmed at these word problems. Just think about, how can I take the statements and translate the pieces and put them together? All right, good, good. So now, for the exciting part, vocabulary. Because we all love vocabulary words. So, some terminology. So you'll, you'll hear us refer to things. Uh, you'll hear us use the word order. This is a first order. This is a, a second order. This is the fifth order, and so forth and so on. So when we're talking about order in relationship to differential equation, what we are looking at is asking, what's the biggest derivative that we see? And that's the order. So this is a little bit different than the order of a polynomial. Order of a polynomial says, OK, look for the largest exponent. Order of a differential equation says, look for the largest derivative. So let's see. Uh, Let's do an example. You can imagine I have something like 7x to the fifth, y prime, plus 2x, y double prime, plus e to the x, sine x times y equals 7. What's the order? 2. Because you look at the derivatives. There's a first derivative, there's a second derivative, there's a, a, the function itself, but you call that a zeroth derivative. So the highest order derivative is 2. In this case, it wasn't at the front. But that's OK. They just chose to write it that way. And so that's the second order. Now, on a side note, there's a little bit of notation here. You might see something written like this, yn, where it's parentheses. And on the other hand, we've also seen cases where we see something like yn, where there's not parentheses. All right, let's start with this. What does this mean if you see something like that? Y raised with an N upstairs. What is that? It's like a power. So it's like you're multiplying Y by itself N times. What does this mean? N derivative. So if you're looking and you're like, what is this weird thing upstairs? Why do they put parentheses? That means derivative. And they might say, 
Well, why do they have that notation? Well, you can imagine if they wanted to look at something where you had the ninth derivative, say plus y prime equals y, what's the order here? Nine, yeah, it's really easy to say. Versus y dot 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 plus y prime equals y, okay, sure. It's, they're both notation. This gets annoying if once you start getting to high order derivatives. So that's why they have this notation. So just, just be aware. All right, the next part of vocabulary. So there's something called an ordinary differential equation. And those are the kinds of differential equations that you see walking around on the street. They're ordinary, very common. And then there's another called the partial differential equation. Now, both of them involve derivatives. The difference is what kind of function is involved. So when we talk about an ordinary differential equation, usually what that means is you have something where you have like y is a function of x. In other words, there's just one thing that can vary. And for that, it's the derivatives that we're used to, that we see in calculus. And by the way, this is the kind of differential equation that we like to do in this class. We will spend most of our time doing ODE, which means ordinary differential equation. So whenever you see the book says this is an ODE, you just say, oh yeah, okay, it's, it's the differential equation that we're used to. What's a partial differential equation? Um, a partial differential equation says, hey, I may have my input depend on more than one thing. So maybe it's not just a matter of where I am, because that's one input. Maybe it's where I am and what time it is. Both things might have an effect on the function. So it's a function with multiple inputs. So where does the partial come from? Well, there's this notion of what's called a partial derivative. And a partial derivative says, I'm going to take the derivative of just one of the variables. So I treat the other variable like a constant. If you're familiar with multivariable calculus, this is what you do in multivariable calculus. So you might have something like uh, f x x plus, oops, well, f t t equals zero. That would be an example of a, of a well, it's a second order, because there's two derivatives. This is notation for uh, partial derivatives. And here we're taking two derivatives with respect to x, two derivatives with respect to t, put them together, we're supposed to get zero. So this is an example of something that can happen. We're not doing that. That's a different class. But we just want to make you aware of the terminology and what may happen. Uh, the last thing, and don't worry too much about this, but I just want to put this up here. Uh, when we say the normal form of a, of a differential equation, it just says put the highest derivative on one side equals everything else. So that would be a normal form. So as an example, nothing up here is a normal form, but I can take this differential equation and I could say, look, I can write the ninth derivative as minus y prime plus y. That would make it into normal form. So I took the highest order derivative by itself equals other stuff. So if it's a first order differential equation, we have y prime is just stuff involving x and y. A second order differential equation is y double prime is stuff involving x, y, and y prime. Now, if you just see this, you might be like, ah, oh, this looks complicated. But just say, this is stuff involving x, y, and y prime. Oh, okay, it's just stuff, all right. That's not so scary if it's just stuff. So that's where we have. We will add more terminology as we go along. And normally when you see more terminology showing up, it's because, hey, we discovered that these particular type of differential equations all have a common theme and a common way to solve them. So usually when you see like, we're gonna introduce things like homogeneous versus non-homogeneous, linear, non-linear. Normally when you see this, it's like, oh, we're identifying certain things are pretty easy to solve. Okay, now, some words of caution. What's our goal? In the ideal situation, if we're doing uh, an initial value problem, so that says we're given some initial values for our differential equation, and we're, we have our differential equation, we'd like to recover the function. That there's one function which will exactly match what we want. 
It'll be where we want it to be at the start. It'll move like we want it to move as we go along. Well, OK. What could be our challenge? Well, we want one. There's two things that could go wrong. We could have zero. In other words, maybe there's nothing that works. Well, what's an example? Suppose we look at this differential equation. y prime squared plus y squared is negative 1. Is that possible? No. No. Especially if we're trying to keep things real. If we let things be complex, OK, maybe a little bit dicey. But no, we're, getting, we're keeping it real in this class. We're keeping it real. All right, so there might be none. The other thing is there might be many. And that's bad because we're saying, look, we, we want the one. We don't want many solutions. So here's an example. y prime is 4x times square root of y, and y of 0 equals 0. So I, I have a function, an initial condition. All right, so the claim is there's multiple solutions. And it tells us. Let's check. Suppose our function is identically 0. And by the way, these functions where they're constant are really, they show up a lot. They're very useful to say, hey, let's not forget about these. Let's remember to check for these. OK, so let's check. Does it satisfy? Well, what's the derivative of 0? Zero? 0. What's 4x times the square root of 0? Zero? 0. So this, this is satisfied. All right. If I plug 0 into the function, which is always 0, what comes out? 0. zero. So the initial condition is satisfied. So this is a solution. OK, what about this one? OK, the derivative of x to the fourth. 4x cubed, all right. Now, 4x, the square root of x to the fourth, x squared. So 4x times x squared is 4x cubed. They're equal. When I plug 0 into x to the fourth, what comes out? 0. Now, I suppose we should make one more observation. Is 0 always the same as x to the fourth? No, they're different functions. So that means that this one has multiple solutions. So this is something which can go bad. Now, I probably have ruined your faith in differential equations. You're like, OK, great. So nothing works. No, no, no. When things are reasonable, you will be OK. You'll, you'll notice, that, of course, I, I put reasonable in quotes because I'm not telling you what reasonable means yet. We'll get into reasonable next week. That's one of the things we get to talk about next week. So as long as we're reasonable, we'll be all right. So there's something unreasonable about this one. Uh, I will say there's another important thing here. It says, as long as we're reasonable, there will be a unique solution in some appropriate interval. So what does that tell us? Well, we might have a solution, but it might not work everywhere. There can be reasons why it works up to a certain point, And then we have to say, we can't get past that point. All right. So we're going to delve into this and see what that could possibly mean. So any questions before we go into some examples? How are you doing? All right. Good. OK. Into the examples we go. So verify that this function, 1 over c minus x, is a solution to the differential equation y prime equals y squared. Find the particular solution, which also satisfies the initial condition, y of 3 equals 2. So that's the second thing. And what can we conclude about y of 5? That's the third thing. So there's like three things here. So this is like three parts. So three times the fun. So first off, to verify. So we have our function. y is 1 over c minus x. We can also write this as y is c minus x to the power of negative 1. So let's do y prime. If we apply the chain rule, what do we get? Minus 1 comes down, exponent comes down. C minus x to what new exponent? Minus 2. We subtract 1 from the exponent. And anything else? Multiply by the root of the inside, which is? 
negative 1. And the nice thing in math is two wrongs make a right. I mean, what? No, no. Negative times a negative makes a positive. That's what I mean to say. All right. So that becomes a positive. Now, the c minus x minus 2 really means I can move it downstairs and write it as something to the 2. So this is the same as 1 over c minus x squared. But what's another name for 1 over c minus x? Well, the reason I'm asking why there's another name for 1 over c minus x is it helps us solve the problem. Uh -huh. So anyway, so, so what's another name for 1 over c minus x? I, I already explained. Oh, oh wait, no. Oh, oh. You meant the variable y. Oh, 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 I am so sorry about that. Yes, sorry about that. Y squared, y squared. OK, all right, good. OK, so this is the verification. Y prime equals y squared. Woohoo! We verified. Yeah. All right. One part done. Now, find the particular solution because notice this has a C in the expression, which means that we don't have one solution, we have many solutions. And so now we're going to say, of all this myriad selection of solutions, we're going to pick one of them. Pick the one that goes through the right point at the right time. So we have to figure out what is the right choice for C. All right, well, so let's look at what happens at x equals 3. Because that's our input. We're putting in x equals 3. And we're told that 2, that's y of 3, which is 1 over C minus 3. All right, what do we do to solve for C? Okay, we can invert, flip both sides. Uh, we can say 1 half is C minus 3. And now what? Add, all right. 3 plus a half? 7 halves. And that's C. So our, our function would be Y is equal to 1 over 7 halves minus X. Now, if you don't like fractions within fractions, and some people don't, I'm not a big fan of fractions within fractions, what could we do to get rid of our fractions within fractions? So I don't like the, the over half here, downstairs. Yeah, we could multiply the downstairs by two. That would get rid of it. But if I do it downstairs, multiply upstairs. So we could also write this as two over seven minus two x. Great. So that's the second part, the, the, the find the particular solution. Now, before we go to the third part, to sort of not get you angry with me when I say what the answer is, let's sketch this function. I know it's a little bit sketchy here, but that's all right. What can you tell me about this function? If you saw this function, you might say to your friend, Look at that function. Do you see that? It has a clear asymptote, asymptote right? Where is that asymptote? Seven halves. OK. So there is an asymptote here. At seven halves. Now, uh, what does it look like? Well. When we say there's an asymptote, it's blowing up at 7 halves. And it's not too hard to see. If I'm below 7 halves, it's going to be a positive number. So it's, it's actually blowing up in this way. So it's going up. And then it's also coming up from below. So there's, there's the function. And one other thing that we should note is that we picked our initial condition at 3. Which side? is 3 on compared to 7 halves. Are we below 7 halves or above 7 halves? Below. All right. OK, so do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. OK. So there's our function. Now, the question is, what can we conclude about y of 5? So if we hadn't done our, our conversation about asymptotes, what would be a natural thing for us to do? Plug in five, right? 
we want to plug in 5, what would we get? We would get 2 over 7 minus 10, negative 2 thirds. Shouldn't that be the right answer? Feels right, doesn't it? But what's, what's our real right answer? What can we conclude about y of 5? All right, and now this is a I'll tell you the answer. We can conclude nothing. <laughs> There's nothing we can conclude about it. What's the problem? Well, the problem here is that when we think of what a differential equation is doing, in particular an initial value problem, it's telling us where to start and it's telling us how we move. So I can start here and I can move. And I'm fine as long as I'm below 7 halves. But what's the problem? See, if I, if I had asked about negative 5, no problem. I can get there. There's no problem. But what happens as I come here? There's this barrier. I can't cross it. The differential equation isn't valid at 7 halves. The function, the solution, it can't skip over this line. So when there's an asymptote, that's a restriction. I can only go up to the asymptote. Yes, I could say, look, there's a, there's a function which has the same expression, but it doesn't apply because I can't connect it by saying start here and follow how it's changing by this rule. And that's why there's a restriction. So this solution isn't valid for all x. Where would it be valid? Yeah, so this is valid for x below 7 halves. So this is a restriction that comes in. So this goes back to, if you remember on the previous, previous slide, we said for some appropriate interval. And that's what we mean, is that you can start the differential equation, and it works, but it can sometimes have places where the function blows up, and then at that point, you can't continue and say, oh, I'll just skip over. No, no, no. It's no longer valid. It's no longer part of the solution. So that's why we have to specify for some appropriate interval. All right. Good. There's a question. Uh, well, with the vertical asymptotes, yes. If you have a vertical asymptote. And you might say, OK, is that the only thing we have to worry about? Well, glad you asked. Let's do another problem. Hmm. Huh. I wonder what this one's going to do. Oh. OK. Well, lots of boxes here. Wow, it's a choose your own adventure and, and getting stuck. All right. So give us some numbers. Zero. Not zero. <laughs> zero is not considered a number. Three is a number. I like three. Four. Four. Two. Two. Five. Five. All right. Uh, so, we're given that xy prime is 3y. And then we want to find a general solution for y. If we are also given that y of 4 equals 2, find a particular solution. And the question is, what can we conclude about y of negative 5? All right, great. Now, at this point, it's a little bit awkward. Because the question is, what do we do with this xy prime equals 3y? We haven't yet mastered the art of solving a differential equation. Well, OK. We'll pull out our black box. Now you're like, Steve, are we ever going to see what's inside? Yes. Next week. Or if you remember back to Calc 1, this was the last topic in Calc 1 is this box. But you're probably thinking, I'll just wait for next week. All right. So here we go. y equals constant x cubed. And you're thinking, wow, that was really fast. Well, it turns out, suppose it had been a 4. 
So the solution would have been constant x to the fourth. If it had been a 42, constant x to the 42. It doesn't matter. It's really easy to solve this one. Now, verify, right? What's the derivative of, of x cubed? 3x three three x squared. So a 3 comes down, and you drop your power down by 1x. Notice, this takes your power of x back up to where it was. So you're back up to 3x cubed. There's still the constant there. On the other side, now there's the 3, and it already was an x cubed. And again, the constant's there. So it's very easy to verify. OK, so find a general solution for y. Check. OK. Well, now we have some initial conditions. Great. Y of 4 equals 2. OK, so uh, let's just see what happens at 4. So we would say that 2 equals y of 4 equals c times 4 cubed. And of course, 4 cubed is 64. Oh, well, great. Oh, nice. We've got some like electrical engineers in the audience. So c times 64 is 2. So what can we say about c? 1 over 32. OK, so now here's a nice solution. 1 over 32 x cubed. OK. Now what can we conclude about y of negative 5? Now we're not going to answer that question yet. I'm just going to draw some things. I like to think that occasionally I can draw some things well, not very well, but some things. Let's draw the curve. But let's do just a couple of cases for different values of c. How about uh, x cubed? We can start with that. c equals 1. x cubed comes up, and it looks like that. All right, how about, what's another choice for c that we can pick? 2. 2. All right, what does the 2 do? It's like a stretching thing, right? So it'll stretch it up. So there's two. How about another choice that we could pick? 22? 42? The answer to life, the universe, everything? Some other values? A half. OK. I like that this class is always po so positive. Bunch of optimists. Yeah, like negative two, right? It could it could go down. Negative one over thirty-two. And one more for me. Zero. <laughs> there we go. All right. Now, what happened? We gathered some information, and uh, let's say. This was our point. I say, hey, look, we've got this curve that works. And our question is, well, can we talk about what happens over here at negative 5? And now you'd say, oh, Steve, this is such a nice function. No asymptotes. Life is good. Oh, we're happy. But are we? Is there anything strange going on? Anything peculiar that you notice? Well, if we had chosen like four instead of three, hmm, anything strange? Anything? Whoa! Multiple curves cross at this point. That's bad. Curves should not cross. There was an old movie came out a long time ago called Ghostbusters, and they were like. You know, one of the important things was like, don't cross the streams. You know, that, that's very bad to do that. That was a plot point. But here, it's very similar. You shouldn't have curves cross that are solutions to differential equations. Now, if you look in the book, it'll say like, hey, these solutions are parallel, which really means these solutions don't cross. So what, why is that bad when things cross? Well, the problem is when they cross, you can go up to the place where you cross, but now, how do you go out? You can go out any way you want, and that's the problem. 
is you don't have a uniqueness. Because once you cross, you say, oh, I can choose how I exit. And so, really, you could say, look, our, our very general form for a solution is actually, you pick a constant x cubed when you're above zero, but you can pick a different constant x cubed when you're below zero, and that's fine. It still satisfies everything. So now, this is another case, problems, problems. But we'll see, again, that, well, something suspicious about this differential equation at zero. So we would say, yes, definitely something bad happens at zero. All right, good. Well, any questions? Good, good. All right, and uh, let's see, I think I have, oh, good, only three more to go. So, uh, recall that y prime equals f of x is a differential equation. We, we, we've already mentioned this in the last couple of sessions. And this is a kind that we already know how to so solve. This is cop one kind of stuff. You integrate, you add c. Life is good. Now you can also do the initial value type solutions. So suppose you say, look, I, I want y prime to equal f of x and I want y of a to equal b. Then you can find what the particular solution is. And it's the following, y of x is b plus the integral from a to x of f of t dt. Now, we can verify that really quickly. So for instance, we can check two things. What is y of a? Well, that would be b plus the integral from a to a, because I'm plugging in x equals a, of f of t dt. Well, what happens when you integrate a to a? What do you get? Zero. Zero. So you get b. Okay, what's y prime? What's the derivative of b? Zero. How do you take the derivative of an integral? What theorem of calculus do you use? All right, fundamental. All right, I was going to say, and it's fun. Yeah, it's fundamental theorem of calculus. So what's the derivative of the integral from a to x of f of t dt? It'll be f of x. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus. And so we see it satisfies the initial condition and it has the right derivative. So it's the solution. Now, in practice, I will say usually this is how people go about doing it namely, find the general form and then solve for the right, see that gives it what you want. So, uh, I'm looking at our time and wondering if we should do this example or, or do a different one. How, how do you guys feel about integration by parts? Good. All right. So we, that means we can fly through this one. It's going to take us hardly any time at all, right? Right. Good. So if you have y prime equals x arc tangent of x, and that says, look, if I'm looking for y, I'm looking for the antiderivative of x arc tangent of x. Now, we're probably thinking, Ugh, should have gone to the next one. How do we integrate this? What's the good tool for us to use? Integration by parts. Yeah, integration by parts is very suggestive, right? <laughs> now you're probably thinking, yes, you should always tell me what tool to use when we're on the exam, because that helps a lot. What about this problem tells us integration by parts is very good? Because there's two parts, but in particular, what's true about one of these parts? Yeah, arc tangent, hopeless to integrate. Forget it. I'm not doing it. As much as I love arc tangent, there's boundaries. Okay. But beautiful derivative. Beautiful derivative. What a function. What a function. So, the idea here is we'll say, look, let's not integrate it, let's take a derivative. So, the way that integration by parts works, it says, if I have the integral of u dv, 
That's uv minus the integral of v du. Right? That's one way to express it. So you have to start by saying, all right, which part do I differentiate? Which part do I integrate? So we're going to differentiate arctangent because it's a pain to integrate, but beautiful derivative. And integrating x is pretty straightforward. So the integral of x, half x squared. The derivative of arctangent, don't break my heart, don't break my heart. Don't you do it, you better get it. 1 over x squared plus 1. Okay, good, all right. Good. Okay, so u times v, 1 half x squared arctangent x minus integral v du. So that's 1 half, uh, all right, as x squared, x squared plus 1. All right. Now you might be thinking, boy, Steve, that's a suspiciously long space you put there. It is suspiciously long. In the interest of time, I could add one and subtract one. Yes? I, I, I appreciate the, yeah, very skeptical there. I think you can. You, you've added zero. That doesn't change anything. It, the, the, the more the skepticism should be, why? Why would you do that, Steve? Well, notice what's downstairs. It's x squared plus 1, right? So, boy, if I could make that x squared look like x squared plus 1, that would be awesome. If I added one, it would look exactly like the downstairs. But I can't just add one. But I can if I also subtract one. So that's why I did it, so that I have sort of matching, matching. So we have 1 half x squared arctangent of x minus, I'll pull out the half here, because that's a constant. And then, you can think of it as two parts. This part becomes 1. So 1 minus 1 over x squared plus 1 dx. OK, so we're almost done. I promise we are almost done. Oop, forgot that, of x. What's the integral of 1? x. x. Minus minus makes a plus, 1 half. Integral of 1 over x squared plus 1. Don't break my heart. Don't you do it. Yeah, that's good. All right, good. Thank you, thank you. And then? Plus c. Plus c. So there is the general form. Are we done? Yeah, we're not done. What's missing? Y0 equals 2. OK, so plug in 0. So 2 equals y of 0. Arc tangent of 0? 0. 0? 0. Our tangent of 0 is still 0. Equals c. And so we can solve for c. And we end up with y equals 1 half x squared arctangent of x minus 1 half x plus 1 half arctangent of x plus 2. And that's the answer. All right, now I have like 90 seconds left. So I'm not going to actually work the problem, but I'm going to talk about the problem here. And I'll record myself doing this later on, so if you really want to see it. That's first order derivative. But there's also second order derivatives. Same principle. Notice this x double prime t is 5 squared of t plus 3. What's not over here? What's not present? There's no x. So this one is something you could do after calc 1. So if you have x double prime and you have some initial conditions, so here's some initial conditions, and I wanted to find x, what's the procedure? Integrate to get x prime. You can solve for the constant. Now you have x prime. What do you do? Integrate again. That gives you x. There's a new constant. And then you plug in. And then there's another example. Again, I'll, I'll record myself later on, where it talks about these word problems, spacecraft heading down. And don't be intimidated by these. These are really Calc 1 problems. You have the technology to solve these. Uh, by the way, this is about landing on a moon. So you can imagine that you have this little spacecraft, and you want to have a, a soft touchdown. 
Well, there are three kinds of things that could happen. You could be going too fast. That's not soft. That's a, a hard touchdown. That's trying, you're trying to go below the surface. You could be firing your rockets, but then you, don't, you start turning around too early. Then you won't touch down at all. So what needs to happen if you want to have a soft touchdown? You want to slow it down, and what should be your speed when you hit the surface? Zero. So that's what it means by soft touchdown. You want it so your velocity is zero when you hit. And again, I'll do that and record it. That's it for now, and uh, pick up again next week, and I hope you have a great weekend. <laughs>